This summer we're doing this seismology internship thingamajigger. The Earthquake Fellows Program at Caltech. It introduces students to a field that you might not typically learn about, and also you get to work with very impressive and inspiring individuals. On the first day, uh, I walk through the door, there's Dr. Lucy Jones there, and it's like, awesome. She was like in the room with us, like in the program, listening and talking and stuff. What we were hoping they would do is to get some more information about earthquakes, some lectures, some demonstrations that let you see like what happens when you slip one rock past another, that they would experience the research process, see what it means just to be in, in a lab. What is science? And also then, what is college? So we gave them a tour of Caltech. We gave them a tour of the Seismic Lab. We had a day just talking about what it was like going to college. We had a discussion about financial aid normalizing that experience so that they could see it as an option for themselves. They also then built a seismometer. They assembled them and they recorded data of how the ground was moving. For the Raspberry Pi seismometers, uh, we use geophones and also some plastic casing to um, uh, protect the seismometer. We connect it to our computers and then um, it will show us live data of uh, the seismic signals it receives. We took the Earthquake Fellows up to the top of Caltech Hall, turned on the shaker so they could see what it meant to shake the building, the idea of that as an experiment. You could feel it, which was really cool. And then on Wei Chunk's computer, he was able to see raspberry shakes, we were able to detect the shaker. My favorite part about the summer program is definitely the people and how much I've learned. Everyone is very encouraging and inspiring and hardworking as well. My group mates, they're really cool. And so being able to, I guess, nerd about like all the different things going on is like really, really fun. We recruited only from Pasadena and Alhambra. Part of the point of this program is to help Caltech and Pasadena get to know each other better. My name's Evan, I'm 16, I go to Pasadena High School. Hey, I'm Annie Zhang, and I go to school at Alhambra High School. I'm Maya Dimas, I go to PHS. I have lived here all of my life. I, I don't know how long, I, I've, never, I've never lived anywhere else. I want these students to come away from this program with a bigger vision of what's possible for them. Not just that they could go into science, that's an important part of it, but understand that going into science could mean a lot of different things. What I hope is that they've taken away from this an understanding that knowledge is something not just imparted to you, but something that you can create. And that being part of that process is a, a deeply um, meaningful sort of experience. I really like how in science you can uh, use uh, very logical facts to model real world phenomena and explain how things work. I'm just interested in science. If it's science, it's cool. And it might be something I never considered before, like, I don't know, astrophysics or something like that. Like, who knows? After, like, being on campus a lot and seeing ev everything that they have to offer and hearing from the students who came here, I definitely am thinking about going to college. You could argue it was only 11 kids. How much difference do you make? But if you make a real difference <laughs> to, to half of those 11 kids, you've made a real difference that might be bringing some new scientist in who wouldn't have been there otherwise. Good afternoon and welcome. On behalf of the Caltech Science Exchange, the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society, and the Seismological Laboratory, I welcome you to Shaking in Our Seats. My name is Michael Gurness. I'm the director of the Seismo Lab, which is celebrating its centennial. The Seismo Lab's mission is the study of earthquakes and the earth below our feet. We are a group of nearly 100 scientists, professors, graduate students, postdoctoral scientists, and support staff who monitor earthquakes and interpret geophysics. We are exploring how the Earth works, what causes earthquakes, why the Earth shakes as it does, why the tectonic plates move, and the composition and dynamics below. 
with generous support from the federal government, the state of California, private foundations, and Caltech benefactors, we work closely with the United States Geological Survey operating our seismic networks. With our collaborators, we are the ones responsible for determining the location, magnitude, and ground shaking when an earthquake occurs in Southern California. We work closely with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory on using space geodesy to track the slow motions of the ground and the effects of earthquake shaking. We coordinate with res emergency responders at all levels of government to communicate what we know, including during those critical moments after a tumbler. Two years ago, with our partners, the USGS and the state, we rolled out an earthquake early warning system, long a vision of my colleagues in the Seismo Lab, to forewarn you and the community when an earthquake has occurred, but before the shaking has started immediately below your feet. I hope that you will find today's program engaging and come out better informed about earthquakes. Without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce Tom Rosenbaum, the president of Caltech and professor of physics. Tom? Well, welcome. It's just wonderful to see this auditorium full, and we're really excited about having the opportunity to introduce to you the Seismo Lab and a lot of what it does for the world. Uh, you heard from Mike a great sketch of what the Seismo Lab is today. Um, I wanted to take this time briefly to trace the history and values of the Seismo Lab through the story of Charles Richter of the Richter scale. So Richter was a graduate student uh, in theoretical physics. Uh, Caltech PhD, 1928, quantum theory of the spinning electron, in case you want to pursue that, uh, studying under Robert Millikan. Harry Wood, the first director of the Seismo Lab, put out a call for a physicist to join the lab. Millikan asked Richter if he was interested, and Richter said yes, knowing nothing of seismology. And this is one of the absolute characteristics of what we do at Caltech. We take people from different backgrounds, we bring them together, and we cross-fertilize in a way that leads to new insights and new discoveries. So Richter's early work was to measure seismograms and locate earthquakes, which was the founding purpose of the Seismo Lab. The context of this is that Harry Wood had collaborated with John Anderson of the Mount Wilson Observatory to develop the Wood-Anderson torsion seismometer, which could capture the short waves of local earthquakes. Prior to this innovation, seismologists could only see the long waves. And with the short waves, you could now think about localizing where the earthquake would be, at least if you had numerous uh, stations, a seismic network. And so this was the founding of seismology as we know it. And it's also another characteristic of great science which is if you develop new instruments, new ways to interrogate nature, you always learn something interesting. Richter realized that with the torsion seismometers uh, capturing data at seven stations, it would be possible to compare the earthquakes, but it was difficult to know how to account for the fact that they were traveling different distances. And so how could you compare their amplitudes to each other? At this point, enter Benno Gutenberg, who is the Seismo Lab director from 47 to 57, a leading Jewish uh, German seismologist who arrived here in 1930 because of the anti Semitism in Germany. Richter brought the attenuation problem to Gutenberg, who suggested that the seismic amplitude should be plotted logarithmically. These logarithmic plots allowed a universal curve where you could now compare the various earthquakes to each other. And here's another lesson. A great institution, a great country, attracts leading scholars from around the world. And it's something that we're devoted to at Caltech. And as you see 
Um, the, the individuals here, as you see the individuals on campus, on the panel, you'll see the way that we bring talent from around the world to contribute to the future of science and the future of the U.S. Between Gutenberg's initial suggestion and his own work in applying magnitude scales to worldwide earthquakes, so Richter's original scale was applied to Southern California, what became known as the Richter scale really should be known as the Richter-Gutenberg scale. But because Gut uh, Richter was comfortable talking to journalists, he became the public face for both the scale and the Seismolab writ large, and the name has stuck. Richter was fully supportive of efforts to reassess and modernize the magnitude scale. Here his name is on it, but he understood that science continues to march forward. And that work was led by Hiru Kanamori and others at the Seismolab, a lot of famous lab names in seismology. Richter himself said, nothing is less predictable than the development of an active scientific field. And this is from someone who knew about unpredictability in terms of trying to figure out the origin of earthquakes. In his later years, Richter became involved in earthquake mitigation, building codes, and assessing seismic risk. And as Mike pointed out, this is one of the areas of how we translate our understanding of the basic science into insights and technologies that benefit society. Uh, seismology and mitigating the hazard of earthquakes was all important to Richter, and he literally brought his work home. He's famously known for installing a seismometer in his living room. So he'd always be ready to study earthquakes and field questions from the media. I think a very good representation of dedication to your craft. Um, let me end with the lesser known Richter scale. This is a song celebrating Richter's career written by Caltech professor of literature, J. Kent Clark. The first few verses go as fo follows. Charlie Richter made a scale for calibrating earthquakes, gives the true and lucid reading every time the earth shakes. Increments are exponential, number zero to nine. When the first shock hit the seismo, everything worked fine. Waves brushed the seismograph as if a fly had flicked her. One, two on the Richter scale, it hardly woke up Richter. With that, enjoy the program. Your attention, please. Earthquakes will be shown in the startling new multi dimension of sense around. Please be aware that you will feel as well as see and hear realistic effects such as might be experienced in an actual earthquake. The management assumes no responsibility for the physical or emotional reactions of the individual viewer. Well, thank you all. Uh, I'll give a bit of a disclaimer and say we don't actually have the sense around machines <laughs> under your seats, so, uh, but we just remembering how earthquakes have been portrayed over the years, it seemed like a really great way to start. So what we're going to do today is look at clips from various earthquakes movies over time, and then ask for uh, reflections by our various experts here to, uh, uh, to what we're seeing and what's real and what's not. So let me start by introducing everybody. Uh, on my left is Professor Zhongwen Zhan, who is a seismologist uh, in the Seismological Laboratory. You know, and I know a lot of the public think that all uh, uh, seismologists and earthquake scientists mean the same thing. They don't. Seismologists are people who study earthquake waves recorded on seismograms to study earthquakes or perhaps the interior of the Earth. There are a lot of other scientists that are involved in earthquake science, and we have one of them at the other end, Domniki Azamaki, who's a professor of mechanical and civil engineering, both uh, at Caltech, obviously. So, you know, once the wave hits the surface of the Earth, the seismologist stops caring and the you know, <laughs> engineer picks it up. Right? But if you actually want to look at what happens to us in earthquakes, you've got to bring in the people side, not really a specialty among us scientists. So we've invited two more people to join us. Uh, Chief John O'Brien, Deputy Chief of the... Acting Chief Deputy. Acting, acting Chief Deputy for Los Angeles County um, uh, Department, Fire Department. 
And of course, Assemblyman Chris Holden, who is our local assemblyman, just re-elected. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, because in the end, if you want to make a difference, <laughs> you got to be working with our elected officials. That's where our uh, changes actually happen. Yeah. So um, I want to remind you before we get going for the rest of it is that we will have a period for question and answer in the end. In your programs, you should have a link that you can use your smartphone to connect to and we'll be uh, able to bring in those questions and we'll address them at the end. But instead, uh, to start though, what we want to do is show a series of clips from three different movies. We have the 1974 earthquake movie that starred Charlton Heston, um, the 1990 Great Los Angeles Earthquake miniseries starring Joanna Kearns, and uh, the 2015 San Andreas starring The Rock. Uh, and all of these uh, uh, portray Caltech in a variety of ways. And we thought that we would start, because all of the movies, not only those three, but basically every disaster movie, begins with a scientist being ignored. That's a <laughs> fundamental trope, right? Fundamental trope to the earthquake movies. So we thought we would start by looking at how these movies saw the scientists doing their jobs. We're ready. Yes, sir, it was. Quite a shock. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, there's no scientific evidence of the 3.1 earthquake can loosen dental fillings. No. Right. Thank you. Walt! Your turn on the PR desk. Here's a strange one. Caretaker at the Hollywood Reservoir Dam drowned at the bottom of an elevator shaft. They still haven't figured out what happened. Okay. He looks sick. I just found out Dr. Adams stayed up at the fault an extra day. So? Well, I, I sent some figures in a memo into the director's office late yesterday afternoon. I don't think he's even read them yet. Figures on what? Well, I, I know you'll laugh, but, but I think we're going to have a really big quake. Probably today, tomorrow at the latest. And I wanted Dr. Adams here to back up my computation. Russell, this is very interesting. You forecast an earthquake in a three to four point range this morning. We had an earthquake in a three to four point range this morning. I'm impressed. Thank you, sir. However, isn't it rather slender evidence for predicting a catastrophe? Sir, these are based on this morning's signals from those stress measurement instruments that Dr. Adams sank during that experimental well project. They indicate another pre-shock, probably before noon today. And if it happens? Then the big one follows in 48 hours, at least seven point. Now, now naturally, if that second minor shock doesn't occur, then it just proves that my computations are based on insufficient evidence. But I think we have a strong... Russell, and... Russell, you are still a graduate assistant. Are you seriously contending that a graduate assistant will be the first scientist in history to pinpoint a major earthquake within 48 hours? No, sir. But I am following through on Dr. Adams' theories and the probability curves that he drew up. But I feel that I've been on the project... Dr. Adams is on a field trip upstate. I sure wish he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rosa. That's right. Good morning. Hi, Claire. Hi. Claire, welcome home. Right. Thanks for the great reception, Jerry. Well, we wanted to welcome you back with a big bang. Question is, how big? Looks like a 4.3. At Bombay Beach? That's not good. You know, we missed you. Oh, dear. This puts the epicenter south of Bombay Beach. Mm-hmm. Between six and ten kilometers. Well, that's not good enough. Rerun it. I want to pin this down to the nearest millimeter before I call Reston. It's the policy of the survey not to quote probabilities. Not unless we've got some damn persuasive evidence. We've got back increasing up. clusters of microquakes, wells going artesian, anomalous radon levels, and oil well pressures, and now a spontaneous eruption of methane gas in the Fairfax district. Isn't that enough? No, 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 no. Then get me a global positioning satellite survey. No, 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 wait, that's not in our budget. No. Issue an emergency survey order, Ray. There's a high probability that we are going to experience a magnitude seven and a half earthquake in this city. All I want to do is raise the alert so people can start getting ready they for this They are thing. ready. Los Angeles is more ready than any other city in this for country. For the cleanup, maybe, not for the quake yeah, itself. Look, may I remind you what happened the last time we went to a B alert? Nothing happened. That's right, nothing happened. 
The governor was embarrassed. The survey is still trying to live it down. You're not a guardian angel, Claire. You're a seismologist and a damn good one. I'm also a worried wife and mother, like a couple of million others out there. They have as much a right to know what's coming as I have. Look, I'm going to level with you, Claire. We've been getting a lot of pressure for you to back off. Heavyweight political pressure. So what? So what? You know we have the right to declare an advisory without hanging on the knob Does of the governor. Does the name Wendell Cates oh, ring a like bell? Big ben. Well, who is he anyway? Thinks he's the Donald Trump of the West. Yeah, well, he had somebody from the Secretary of the Interior's office call to let us know that he was a big contributor to the president's campaign. The president's campaign, for Pete's sake. Are you going to cave in? Not if I can help it. You're too valuable to us, Claire. But you won't be valuable to anybody if you get canned. Now look, you better be damn sure about this one. Because if it's another false alarm, I won't be able to protect you this time. Lawrence, I gotta show you something. No? Uh-huh. Uh, we got a rare low-level seismic swarm out in Falcon, Nevada. 23 small quakes, all tiny, 2.0 to 2.6 in the last 24 hours. Okay. Where the hell is Falco, Nevada? 35 miles southeast of Vegas, maybe five miles from the Hoover Dam. Right. There aren't any faults out there. Any known faults. Now, if we can get there while the mini quakes continue, we can test our theory. And if the magnetic pulse rate goes up before the quakes? Then we're predicting them. Then we are predicting them. All right, let's go check it out. Lawrence, it's incredible. This is the third mini quake since we've been here. The magnetic pulse rate has increased before each one of them. We got a pattern, my friend. That was a 2.2. Our model's predictive. <laughs> we got it right, man, finally. <laughs> yep, we sure did. <laughs> Stanley, you've publicly stated that someday scientists will be able to predict earthquakes. Well, actually, as of yesterday, we now believe that we can predict them. Professor! Talk to you a sec. Yeah, I'm sorry. Excuse me. What is it? Current pulse rates at our monitoring stations all along the San Andreas Fault. Their averages are spiking from 82 to 85, with the biggest jumps coming from San Francisco. More than 20 points higher than what we saw in the Nevada. We checked. We double checked. Then we reset all the instruments and triple checked. Those are the counts. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Um. Okay. Uh, if we draw a line from the bottom of the San Andreas up to the Hoover Dam, it almost literally follows the Colorado River is a natural deformation event and geologically deformation events mark boundaries they mark boundaries so what if what if this whole chunk of land is connected to our tectonic plate that would tell us that what happened yesterday in nevada was not an anomaly no what if it was a precursor movement along the leading edge of the plate boundary fault from Los Angeles all the way up to San Francisco? Are you saying you think the whole San Andreas fault might go off? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Who should we call? Everybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um... Out. So this is a look at how uh, <laughs> Hollywood sees us doing our jobs. Um, and one noticeable part about this, of course, is that all of the scientists, uh, they, Hollywood's sure that we really do know something. We're just not saying it for some reason or another. Um, we all know that, of course, there's never been a successfully predicted earthquake but we have had different attempts over time. Uh, which one of these movies, Zhang Wen, as the seismologist, do you think is uh, doing the best job of uh, uh, presenting that? Well, I, I, see, I hear a lot of laughter for the last one. I think that's the <laughs> one that is also pretty hard for us to watch. It's kind of the totally crazy one. 
So <laughs> I think with that pretty low bar there, um, <laughs> the other two movies was actually doing something you know, good, trying to understand what a seismologist was trying to do at the time. Uh, so in the 1970s, there was a period of time when seismology was you know, optimistic that we will be able to predict earthquakes, partially because there was this so-called successful prediction of high China earthquake in China, partially because some of the competition with the Soviet Union, like who was going to get this holy grail of earthquake prediction first. So under that kind of case, people have tried many different things. Uh, some of the notable ones were from uh, the Seism Lab, and there were some other crazy ones asking people to report you know, animals, strange behaviors you know, near the San Andreas Fault. And, but, but people tried for many years. But I think in the 1974 movie, they were really trying to show what people was trying uh, at the time. But you know, either the more kind of uh, uh, approach with some physical basis or the some of third ones, nothing worked. You know, until 1980s, people basically you know gave up on this and say this kind of precursor what we're hoping for does not seem to exist. Right? We just couldn't find this. And also, we also understand earthquakes better, and that means you know we are moving towards uh, you know uh, from kind of earthquake prediction to say based on past earthquakes to understand what the probabilities of earthquakes in the future. So as you can see in the second movie, they were talking about alert levels based on previous earthquakes. So I think they were trying to show what seismology was trying to do at the time. But then seismology all moved towards the earthquake guarding warning, as Mike mentioned uh, in, in the opening remarks. So in the last two decades, this has been improving a lot. But strangely, the San Andreas movie sort of go back about 40 years <laughs> into this kind of precursor speaking stuff. So that's a little bit uh, disappointing here. So <laughs> I think they're, they're kind of, uh, kind of they're, um, uh, try to understand what Sesma is doing. I think we seem to be doing worse in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys, I, either you, John, or Chris, had experience in receiving or hearing about predictions or hearing people uh, wanting to find more, or how people are responding to it now, or is, is, the, is in the public dying down? I don't know. You know, when, when you really think about it, and you put it in context here in the LA metro area, the last big shake we had was in 1994. You've had almost an entire generation that has never felt an earthquake. So earthquakes are something that keep us in emergency services up at night thinking. We know the broad magnitude of the LA County area being one of the most populous areas in the United States and the world and the damage that a large scale infrastructure, particularly the one that we look at with the shakeout model, mm -hmm. can cause and what that is going to do. And so really thinking about that preparedness level is where we like to capitalize and work. You do hear the talks of prediction, but I don't think in, you know, our partnership with the scientific community is strong. We're always with the scientific community and have had multiple meetings and seminars hosting, but prediction isn't really where it, we like to try to focus. It's much more on that preparedness and making sure that everyone is prepared for that earthquake in advance of anything occurring. You know, for so long, we always talked about having three days or 72 hours worth of supplies, but so much of that conversation is now shifted to, you really need to be prepared for up to 10 days um, because we know that it's going to take a tremendous amount of time to get that infrastructure in. So prediction, not so much, but certainly preparedness is where we like to focus our energies. Okay. I, I think that's right. And I think, you know, I grew up uh, in the era of duck and cover, get under your, you're in school, and that's pretty much how they prepared us, that you make sure that there's an earthquake, here's how you have to prepare for yourself and deal in that, in that moment. But as you see over the like in the, the series of movies, that as more information became a, a, a available to the public, then we started as policymakers being in a position to respond to that. So when you see um, unreinforced masonry brick buildings crumbling uh, and then putting uh, lives in, je in jeopardy, it became important for the policy to then uh, follow to say, well, we have to do reinforcement uh, structural reinforcement for these unreinforced masonry brick buildings. And, and it really the purpose was just to protect life. Then it evolved to concrete tilt-up buildings that were susceptible after the 72 uh, earthquake. So I think for policymakers, we want to always be in a position to 
respond to the science and technology as it's evolving and as understanding of how earthquakes perform and the impact on, on community. These, these movies are, they're, they're sort of a, comical in the sense that they set pop culture around how you respond and how you um, address it. But for the policymaker, I think we're looking at how families can communicate in the event they're separated. Uh, what does that look like? Meeting places. We work through, the, the, through those type of steps to make sure that people are in the best position to survive. I, I'll agree with, with John Wen. I will just a bit of uh, nostalgia at this. My first earthquake that when I came to Caltech was in 1986 and uh, the North Palm Springs earthquake. And I was not being interviewed. One of our professor, Heaton was, and he uh, was asked, you know, has the earthquake been predicted? And his response was, not yet. <laughs> um, it, it didn't take more than a few years to when a prediction was going around in the 90s. And the, the question from the reporters was, this can't be right, can it? So uh, I think we did get the message through eventually. Pretty fast. One of the other things, I, I mean, this is also how Hollywood sees us doing our jobs, right? And you notice uh, the interaction between students and professors and uh, lone wolves and all of the various approaches. I was going to ask Dominique to comment on how you see, uh, is that what your lab is like? No. <laughs> <laughs> In the movie, you see the professor work by himself, but maybe with a graduate student who's taking the data and then sharing his understanding, and they try to figure out what's going on. And this interaction between faculty and student and the excitement of, oh my God, our, our, our model is predictive, is, is conceptually true. But after that, there's so many levels of second and triple checking, of peer review, getting our colleagues to check our results, debate about them and until we get to the media to announce our predictive model. So this notion that there's a scientist and he's predicting real time while the TV is shooting the video, that is, <laughs> <laughs> that is not how we work. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> research doesn't happen in isolation. Yeah. Well, why don't we move on now? The next section we have, of course, the other trope of a disaster movie has got to be the disaster itself. So let's look at how they portrayed the earthquakes.
San Andreas Fault. Okay. So, you might not believe this, but this is only about 20, 25% of the actual footage from the different movies during the earthquake. But we tried to get the ones that were the most fun. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start now with our engineer, so Al Stomniki. There's a lot of damage going on. What did you think of it? So the first thing to point out is that the better the special effects get, the worse the movie gets, the damage. <laughs> <laughs> so 1974, the, the buildings are damaged because the ground shakes. When the ground shakes, somebody pulls the rug out of the building's pitch and the building starts swaying as a consequence. In 74, there were buildings sitting on very thin columns, but in fact, you see them shaking and you see the building fall because the columns at the bottom fail. By the time you get to 2015, there's those tall buildings that crumble or even explode from the top to the bottom. That doesn't happen. The, gr <laughs> the ground moves and the building sways, so the most vulnerable building is closer to the base. Right? So there's no explosions, there's no crumbling of, of structures. They do, however, I mean, so the, the, the 74 depicts better the, the damage. On the, on the opposite side, dams sus are susceptible to earthquake damage, usually earth dams due to infiltration, but there's no major consequences on the concrete dams. So there's only maybe 12 uh, dams around the world that have been obliterated by earthquakes, and most of them have been hydraulic fields and relatively older dams that had poor design. But so, that, so that part is totally unrealistic, of course, and the guy cannot run faster than the earthquake rupture, and that's another. <laughs> but I'll leave, that, I'll leave that in the chasm uh, for, for long length. <laughs> but on the, on the water, however, uh, transmission and distribution and storage facilities, as well as electricity port, telecommunication, all these are real and, 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 uh, and very likely consequences of a, of a big earthquake. What did you think about this? Have, I, were you around in 94? Did you get to your I was around in 94. I, was, uh, <laughs> I just started my fire service career in 94. But, you know, the, the big thing that I note, uh, not necessarily from the scientific side, but if you saw each of them showed the panic that set in in the people as the earthquake started. And I think that's something that we should all expect when we have an earthquake. You know, the key to surviving an earthquake, as I alluded to earlier, is preparedness. But in the fire service, we have a saying, train as if your life depends on it, because at the end of the day, it does. And so doing things like the classroom drop cover and hold exercises, 
orchestrating earthquake plans at home, coming up with a plan, knowing what you and your family members are going to do. I don't know how many of you have thought of keeping a pair of shoes next to your bed every night when you go to bed. Because <laughs> one of the biggest hazards out there is going to be glass following an earthquake. If you don't have those shoes there put on your feet, you're going to become one of the injured. And we just know when we have a large scale earthquake, there's just not going to be enough first responders to do everything that needs to be done. And so then when we, additionally, as we kind of start to look through back at the films, one of the biggest hazards, and I think we saw it most specifically in the first film, was people running outside during the shaking and the falling hazards coming down. I think they did a pretty accurate job of depicting the hazards that are going to be out there because while many of our buildings, especially in the downtown area, are going to be engineered to survive significant shaking, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have glass popping out and falling to the ground and some of those accoutrements that hang from those buildings coming down and raining down on top of folks. So I mean, I guess the greatest message we as first responders have is that preparedness piece, really kind of practicing this with your family, with your coworkers, having a plan, whether it be in the work environment, the home environment, the school environment, so you know what to do. And there's plenty of resources out there to help everyone get to pe prepared. Ready.lacounty.gov has a ton of resources. The Shake Alert has a ton of resources, as does the Great Shakeout website. Yeah. And I noticed both the first two movies did a great job of glass. Yes, yep. they sure did. Worry about glass. <laughs> um, but to get back to the earth, uh, we did end that with the chasm. Um, and one might say, oh, that's only Hollywood. But I did once have a legislator ask me when we were going to get the earthquake with the chasm. How'd you respond to that one, John? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that huge crack is a huge insult to the scientist board. <laughs> 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 if the scientist board can speak, they probably say, I'm a proud strike steep board. I move sideways. <laughs> I don't just open up uh, like that. Uh, and actually, you know, the fact is none of the fault, any other fault would open up like that because of this uh, huge weight of crust of rocks. Even if you are pulling the crust apart, they just slide, you know, along the fault, uh, up, up and down like that. It won't open a big crack like that. Yeah. And the, the, the first movie, 1974, may actually be more realistic in the sense they show the movement of the fault kind of near the surface. Maybe that was because the 1970, uh, 71, 71, yeah. And the earthquake just happens, I still remember that. I would argue the, the, the movement will be slow. Now we have a lot of instruments. Sometimes we see the fault was moving like a meter per second uh, mm -hmm. near the fault. So what's showing the movie may actually be uh, less strong than during the earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that stands out? One of the things that stands out to me is people uh, mm -hmm. falling down in the first one, running like mad in the last one. Ahead of the rupture, yeah. yeah. Anybody want to comment on that reality? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I think there's a reason why so many in public sector as well as the scientists have gotten together and worked collaboratively to really get that message out and why the message is drop cover and hold on, not run like hell and get out of there. Uh, yeah. it, it's because during those shaking events, you're not going to be able to necessarily stay on your feet. And you look in that first movie, they did a decent job of showing as people were trying to run, they were falling, they were getting hit with debris and everything else. Fast forward to the special effects of the 2015 San Andreas, you know, he's in a full uh, sprint, looked like he's running a professional 100 carrying a child and then was able to <laughs> leap and throw as, as you have this significant momentum that's just going to be really, literally dropping you to your knees. I'm also starting to realize the time, so I think I'm going to take us on to the third clip where we get our aftermath where we can take some of these ideas a little bit farther. What happens after the earthquake? I'm talking with the at the dam, Mayor Lewis, and I'm maintaining a constant inspection. I can't take any chances, Colonel. Dr. Stockel said we can expect aftershocks. And I just got a report from the building and safety department. They say some structures may look perfectly sound, but have been so weakened that even a minor quake can bring them down. Evacuate the area immediately below the dam. It is a precautionary evacuation. We repeat, there is no present danger of the dam collapsing. Move to high ground west of Highland Avenue and north of Franklin. It is a precautionary evacuation. I'm getting out of here. We repeat, this is a precautionary evacuation. Stay there, stay there. 
Stay there. Come on, lay down. You're gonna be all right. You're gonna be all right. There's other buildings sure to have come down. First time in my life I'm ashamed of my profession. We never should have put up those 40-story monstrosities. Not here. Hey! What's the matter? The door's out of line. It wasn't before that aftershock a few minutes ago. Kevin, this is uh, Todd Harris in New York. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, yes, I can, Todd. What is the situation there? Todd, the city of Los Angeles is virtually paralyzed tonight. The loss of life is incalculable at this time. Power is out in most of the city, as is water in many areas. We have reports that most of Santa Monica is on fire. Well, it looks like it. As we flew over the city earlier today, we could see thousands of fires. Most of them probably caused by ruptured gas lines. We can only pray that a Santa Ana wind doesn't come up or the entire city will be turned into a raging inferno. Running on electricity isn't going to work, so we have to find a rotary or a push button phone. How do you know all this? My dad, he works for LA Fire and Rescue. Over here. Great. I'll look for a landline.
quick. Dad. Dad, I got out. I'm okay. Uh, she's okay. <sighs> Meanwhile, recovery efforts have begun in the Bay Area, where FEMA, the National Guard, and UN relief teams have all been mobilized, aided by the thousands of volunteers pouring into the state. So much. Okay. Um, start with fires? Certainly fires are a major concern of ours following an earthquake. You think of the infrastructure damage that's going to be done when you look at the majority of our water supply lines. They're run underground. As that ground shakes, you're going to certainly expect to see ruptures there. The other major utility that's run underground that we see there most of the time too is our natural gas service. And so certainly we expect post-earthquake that there is going to be some uh, issues with fire following that earthquake. You get some ignitions and is that going to lead to what we call urban conflagration? You know, you get one structure in a community that starts going, that can quickly lead to multiple structures running. We saw it in the great San Francisco fire or uh, earthquake of 1906 that almost uh, destroyed the entire city. Much different times, buildings built totally different, but it spawns that thought process that we all have to think about. And part of what I alluded to early on is that idea of we as a society need to become more self-sufficient following an earthquake. Mm -hmm. Through LA County Fire and LA County Office of Emergency Management, we offer trainings that are called Community Emergency Responder Training Sessions. It's typically about a class that goes over the course of two weeks and teaches all of those basics that help communities become more self-sufficient and self-resilient following an earthquake. Everything from how to turn off natural gas in the neighborhood to ideas of basic first aid techniques that can be employed to help members in your own community sustain because we certainly know within LA County, LA County fires jurisdiction and we cover about 2300 square miles of the county which overall is over 4000 square miles. You know, we have 177 engine companies on duty every day. We have 3400 firefighters among all of our three shifts. Put that in perspective to nearly 12 million people in the LA metro area. There's just not going to be enough of us to go around. So really encouraging everyone to get out there and participate in many of these training opportunities to realize that self-sustainability that's going to need to occur post one of these events is really something I just cannot push enough. Yeah. Actually, if we go to the end of the event, I'll work my way. There's just too much to talk in here, but I was going to ask the assemblyman about actual relief efforts. Are we going to be out in big camps up on the hills? Well, I, no, I hope not. But <laughs> uh, and as I was watching the last uh, clip, I was thinking, well, if we ever are in a big one like that, I, I kind of want to be on Team Rock. <laughs> <laughs> he can fly us out of here. <laughs> right over the, over the edge. Um, but I think one of the things that's important to note, too, and it kind of also ties into the, the earlier first question, was that we may not be in a position to predict earthquakes, but we are in a place where technology is allowing us to get early warning. And I think what I was seeing a lot in these clips were that it was suddenly people were caught in a moment where they didn't have much choice. Uh, but we know that with the work that uh, Caltech is doing and on early warning detection and, and having sensors placed along the fault lines uh, along the state, it gives us a head start when we know that an earthquake is going to happen, which allows us to start to shut down um, our rapid transit system, light rail systems, allows families to be able to be in a position where they can be prepared and brace. And so I think that from that standpoint, that puts us in hopefully a stronger position on the other side, that we don't find people having been in positions where they were victimized when they had an opportunity to have an alternative op uh, option. So there's that, but I think that's also, as the, the chief said, is just about really being prepared. It really is um, having family connected, understanding uh, what the game plan is, and really having a plan 
so that even if they're in different places, there's an, a, a meeting place, there's a way to communicate in case cell towers are down, because those are the ways that I think we're gonna be in the best position to survive. Hmm. Zhang Wen, you wanna comment on our proud San and strike slip, our proud strike slip fault giving us a tsunami of that magnitude? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the last part about the tsunami, that kind of tsunami is really only generated in the, so what we call the subduction zones. When one place goes under another, so you can have a lot of up and down motion in the sea floor can displace a large volume of the water. And for the kind of fault we have here, a strike view fault, okay. they were not produce a big tsunami. Right. <laughs> and the fact that it runs parallel to the coast is actually also interesting. The motion is this way, but the tsunami fault also is this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of things to comment about that special effects. Uh, did you have anything more you wanted to say about the infrastructure and what we saw, or communication? I just, or yeah, I just wanted to point out the the fire ignition happens by for gas, and it's also accentuated by the fact that also water pipelines break, so there might be not enough water to put the fire out. Mm -hmm. There's also electricity that causes fire ignite ignition. Uh, probably around 40% of the fires that are ignited during post earthquake are happening because of electricity poles that fall, or wires that are bare. <laughs> The telecommunications fail, so this scene of the daughter trying to reach the dad and say, I'm fine, is actually a, an unexpected consequence of an earthquake. Uh, yeah, so that was appropriately portrayed, albeit a little more. <laughs> well, if we're going to have any time for questions at the end, I think I better get us to our last clip, which is really to talk about the relationship between the scientists, policymakers, and emergency responders, at least how Hollywood sees it. How big a quake? A seven on the Richter scale, possibly higher. And that could release more than the total energy generated by the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombs combined. If I issue a public warning, you know it'll happen to this city. Oh, of course, we know that's impossible. But there are some precautions you could take, aren't there? Alert the police, the fire department. Have the governor mobilize the National Guard. Well, he could announce that it's necessary to prevent looting at the Valley Quake site. Well, the police have that situation totally under control. Mayor Lewis, the next situation, if it comes, would be somewhat different. The governor and I aren't even in the same party. This turns out to be a false alarm. It'll make me look like the biggest fool west of the Mississippi. Second biggest. I'll top the list. And I'm telling you that all this activity on the Newport Inglewood Fault has increased the chance of a great quake right here in the Los Angeles Basin. Last week, it was Bombay Beach. OK. OK, I was wrong about Bombay Beach, but mm. this is different, Chad. Those quakes were a warning. Well, I am you yourself say. Could be a matter of months, even years. Conservatively, yes, but from the pattern we see developing, I feel there's a high probability it'll happen sooner. But if you're wrong, our credibility's in the toilet. Look at these factors. Now, according to my theory, which this hasn't is a... been put to the test yet. What about Mexico? You said it. Once isn't enough. How many times is enough? Three, four, ten? Or will you only be satisfied when you look out that window and see the city level, Chad? We may be sitting on a major disaster here. People have the right to know. That's our responsibility. You telling me what my responsibilities are? Why are you fighting me on this? I'll take a suggestion under advisement. Why is it the Japanese see quake prediction as an opportunity and we see it as a threat? Do you know what this kind of thing could do to the real estate market in this town? I'm not a keeper, Wendell. I just work with the woman. Well, maybe you should find some way to muzzle her, or you'll be looking for a new job. Now, wait a minute, Kate. No, no, no. You wait a minute. It only takes a word in the governor's ear, pal. There's a lot at stake here. She's got a strong position, Wendell. It's still a roll of the dice, and that's all. No, it's more than that. Look, earthquakes have definite patterns. They know from years of accumulating data on earthquakes all over the world. 
It's fed into a computer, and it gives them a general profile of how quakes behave, a general pattern. And when you get a pattern like this one, it's a good probability you're going to have a bigger quake in the near future, a great quake right here under the city. We can't ignore that. The governor can't. Theories, mathematical probabilities. Now, if I went on probabilities, I'd go broke every time I went to Vegas. You might as well try numerology or astrology. It's just as reliable. Science is based on probability, Wendell. Oh, really? Well, you know, I wonder what the probability of a giant meteor falling out of space and flattening the whole damn city is. That's what I wonder. And I wonder what damn difference it makes to know. What are we supposed to do? Throw our arms in the air and run around like crazy people? Chicken little, chicken little, the sky is falling. Bull! Well, look, we're all going to die sooner or later. And the reason that most people don't want to know when is because they couldn't enjoy life if they did. OK, sooner or later, a big quake's going to come and shake the town up a little. So what? Who needs to shout it on street corners? It scares the hell out of the investors. And look, pal, I don't pay you to let some four-eyed bimbo turn you into jelly. I want all the data from every monitoring station still up along the fault line and get it for me now. Right. What's going on? This is not over. Oh, man. Come on. I need everybody. What are we doing? Getting you on the air. We need to warn people. How? There's no way to upload a signal. <laughs> oh, you're at Caltech. Okay, who wants an A in independent study? I'm starting a new class. How to save lives by hacking media outlets. Oh, yeah, man, I'm in. Sweet, bro, get your laptop. Let's go. <laughs> the adventures graduate student. <laughs> well, since we are at Caltech, uh, <laughs> if you notice, uh, the first movie, they're working together. The second movie, they're fighting. The third movie, the scientist doesn't even acknowledge the policymaker exists. Um, Assemblyman, what's, what do you feel our relationship has <laughs> been? <laughs> Duck and cover. No, First of all, I think it's, uh, I, you have to believe in the scientists, and you have to believe in the data, and you have to bring in as much information as you can before you um, start putting too much out there because it can send the wrong signal or be premature. And I think that for, you know, when we're dealing with immediate issues of emergency, the most information that you can have up front, having public safety be part of the conversation and being really clear and sober about what you're dealing with and making sure that what you put out will be edifying and, and helpful to the public as, a re as opposed to creating uh, fear. But as I said before, when technology starts to put us in a stronger position that we can get a sense of what may be happening within seconds so that we can react appropriately Having data, having the scientists community be a part of that um, shaping of a message, I think is, is critical. And so for, for me, uh, you hear it now, and you hear it in our, in our normal way of how our country and people respond to whether or not there is a climate crisis. It is that same kind of mindset that, you know, those that deny, deny the science. And if you embrace the science, then you can embrace opportunities to be in the strongest position to react and for the public to be properly informed and be in the best position uh, to be able to know the next step to make and know how to do it without creating chaos. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, oh, actually, to both of our professors here, um, given that Northridge is our last significant earthquake, you haven't had experience with that post-earthquake demand for information. Um, you feel ready? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that you know, uh, it's important to communicate what scientists know about the earthquake. I think it's also important to communicate what we don't know about mm -hmm. uh, this uh, earthquake. So sometimes there's a misconception of you know, you have some confidence about something that may be actually also a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to have a communication about both. 
Yeah. Mm. I, I would also say too that you know the, the communication has to happen before you have the crisis. There has to be kind of this partnership, a collaboration, so that as we are thinking and planning for the future, we're understanding what the possibilities are because that helps us, I think, in terms of how we set good policy, uh, how we prepare in terms of our infrastructure. We'll be happy to know that our city hall sits on rollers because there's an understanding that by having an ability to move along with the movement of the earth, that that preserves and keeps life uh, in, in a good place. So I think it's just really also having that collaboration and having the truth. I think people really want to just understand what is the truth and how do we now move forward understanding the limitations mm -hmm. of our knowledge, but also to take what we do have and implement it in a way where we can regulate our, ourselves, put our infrastructure in place so that it saves lives, mm -hmm. provide information on how people should react when things start happening around them and no one's there to hold their hand, but they have to be able to be self-educated to be able to move forward in a way that keeps themselves safe and their family as well. Well, and you know, as uh, watching these movies and sort of taking me back in time with the various discussions about prediction over the years, one of the things I ended up with as somebody who tried to predict earthquakes back when we still thought it might be possible um, was, do you really want two hours to get out of a building or a building that doesn't fall down in the first place? Right. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what really makes a difference is what we can do before the crisis to change the environment that we're working on, not just be prepared for what comes down, but how to prevent it in the first place. And, and Dominique, you've been involved with some of these things of trying to understand mm -hmm. what's going on and experience in uh, trying to share it. Yeah, so the, I think we are responsible for actually trying to take our knowledge from the laboratory, from the simulations, and then communicating it in a way that looks real. Uh, and so the problem with earthquakes and engineers is we don't have a laboratory. The laboratory is our natural world. And we can't order an earthquake and then start studying what happens. And so what we end up doing is we travel around the world and we look at disaster zones after earthquakes. And we try to, A, understand things that we expected to fail and try to validate our models. We try to see things that didn't fail and try to understand why. And usually surprises come up in both in areas. For example, in Nepal, when I, I traveled in 2015, the expectation from a big earthquake was that the city with the Kathmandu was gonna be uh, completely destroyed. And the earthquake had such characteristics that it barely touched the buildings in the, in the base. And, uh, and those lessons we take and we transport them back uh, here and we try to improve our models and try to transpire some of this uncertainty or understanding into the design uh, of the structures. I'm also recognizing the time <laughs> and remind you that we, I think it's time to move on to more general questions. I can ask lots of questions if you don't supply them for me, but remember that you can uh, uh, submit your questions through, uh, through the link and it'll show up on my, on my iPad. Uh, whenever you put it in here. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm looking at what are my options. Um, I have one question here I'd like to share with each of you. What's your favorite earthquake? <laughs> <laughs> the one that doesn't happen? <laughs> <laughs> but given you have a reality, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I guess my favorite earthquake, the 2008 Chino Hill earthquake, um, it was actually the, about the first week I come to US. I'm a graduate student <laughs> at California. I've been studying earthquake for a few years, but this was the first time actually an earthquake happened, and I feared it, and it feels like a welcome earthquake to California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the seismologist. We think of them as welcoming earthquakes, but. <laughs> that's not a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Dominique, do you have one? So when I was an undergraduate student, the second year of my undergraduate studying earthquakes in Greece, I had the opportunity to travel to Japan with my professor and look at damage after the Kobe earthquake. And I was blown away to see the, the, the damage that we were studying and the possibility of, of, of creating structures that withstand earthquakes to see them in real life. So I would say probably that was my, 
my introduction into, into this field to try to see it uh, live. So 1995 Kobe. Yeah. Chief, you're going to go for one or you going to agree with the assemblyman? No, no, I'm actually going to go for one. <laughs> <laughs> As a lifelong resident of Sierra Madre, the 1991 Sierra Madre earthquake, uh, course, yeah. I, I slept through the whole thing. I had a water bed. <laughs> Had a waterbed at the time. Uh, <laughs> my family was all gone down in Mexico. Uh, I had stayed back because I was a lifeguard at the local community pool. I slept through the whole thing and woke up to hear pipelines bursted down below the house, hissing water, everyone, the chimney falling down into the backyard. And uh, it was just one of those uh, experiences that, you know, you, you always. Seals stick you with for me. life, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's look at. Uh, um, uh, what would be a good one to put in here? Um, well, uh, Zhang Wen, do modern sensors gather acceleration in three directions? Do they do rotation? How do we actually record the earthquakes? Yeah, uh, actually that's a good question. I, I don't want to go too technical here, <laughs> but we have many different kinds of sensors. Um, most of the sensors we have in Southern California, they do measure the motion of the ground in three components, north, south, east, west, and up and down. We also get other kind of sensors that can measure rotation or deformation. Uh, a recent research on myself is how to turn fibers in cities to measure extensions uh, of the cables on the ground. So there are many different types of sensors that we can use. Mm -hmm. ground motion. Mm -hmm. huh. Would it be a good idea to keep a landline specifically for disasters? You know, I, I, I'll, I'll jump on that one real quick. I think you have to be careful with that. And uh, I don't think there's going to be any one proven solution that is going to be a good idea. Landlines typically nowadays are tied into v voice over internet protocol anyways. So a lot of that when the damage from an earthquake occurs, it's, you're going to have that damage as well. In addition to that, you know, with the shaking and many of our phone lines run pole to pole, you know, depending on how violent that shaking is, you mm -hmm. can certainly see those lines damaged. Yep. Uh, cell phones, you know, we, we run back to cell phones and what they do and what they are for us in our lives today. We know that even if the network is able to stay up and the network's going to be dependent on what happens to each of those cell sites and repeater sites, which many of them don't have backup generators. They don't have backup batteries that'll last for a certain number of hours, 48. but 48, thank you. 428. Oh, 428, sorry. Mm -hmm. 48 requires a generator. A generator. You know, that infrastructure is gonna be so overwhelmed. The one little tidbit I throw in everyone's head to think about is text message over voice call. That text message, a lot of times, you know, it's such a small piece of data, might run through the network and actually get to some place where you want it to get versus uh, a voice call or even an iOS message or anything similar to that. You know, working for the fire department, we still carry around those alphanumeric pagers from the 1980s. And everyone laughs at us and like, you just really haven't cleared into technology, have you? Well, we have a specific reason that we carry those around because, you know, those pagers, we think, again, we think, it all depends on the damage and the infrastructure out there, we'll be able to at least receive messages coming out of our dispatch center, so. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Niki, what are the most dangerous and least dangerous types of buildings in an earthquake? The most dangerous. Uh, so that, it depends. Uh, it depends on how close the building is to a fault. It depends on what the geology is under the building, how big a magnitude of earthquake the fault can give. And all these things being the same, I guess the older buildings, the so first story and the unreinforced masonry have proven over time and time again that are dangerous. Uh, and we are learning in every earthquake, we take lessons and we adopt them in design and we're getting better and better. So the modern buildings tend to be a lot safer than, than, uh, than older buildings. Uh, I guess I'll stop there. And actually a follow-up. Most of us will be in a wooden structure. How do they perform? Wooden structures tend to perform very well. They are, they are light structures and they are fairly flexible. So they, perf they, they conform well to the shaking of the ground. And, uh, and they tend to be also low, low structure, lower structures. So that's, that's pretty a safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Sorry. laughs> um, there's too many to choose from. Uh, 
I think this one might, what can you say about the Mexican 7.1 earthquake that happened on the same date, almost the same hour throughout more than 30 years? <laughs> the ninth, you know, September 19th. Yeah, I just say it's a very nice coincidence. Yeah, it's yeah. just <laughs> random chance. I guess there are hundreds of people in this room. There are many people have the same birthdays. Uh, yeah. You know, it's very nice coincidence, but you know, when you have uh, an earth, uh, a large number of, you know, it's gonna happen. I'm gonna bring up, since you brought up the Sierra Madre earthquake, June 28th has had three big earthquakes. There was a Parkfield earthquake in 66, the Sierra Madre earthquake in 91, and the J Landers earthquake in 92, all on June 28th. Oh. So I'm not worried on June 28th, except for I sometimes do some extra tweets. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, oh, what, how many foreshocks can there be? Oh, how many foreshocks can there be? That's a great question. Of course, this is also what, Dr. Lucy Jones <laughs> made some pioneer work. Yes, but I, I'm moderator here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So of course, the, the, what, what we call a, a foreshock when the main shock hasn't happened, that was the main shock, and only when one of the aftershock become bigger than the, this earthquake, we call it a foreshock. And the, usually, what we found about looking at earthquake in the past is that five percent of the main shocks have this kind of a foreshock activities. So, you know, they are useful. You know, when earthquake happen, you do know that earthquake trigger other earthquakes, but you know, it's only 5% of them. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah. know, this is a general message based on this kind of probability. Earthquake probability is always gonna be low. It's go from like extremely low. To sort of low. To sort of low. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of government policy, so I'm gonna hand, hand this one to you, as I'm mm -hmm. how do we approach funding for key infrastructure, such as hospitals that need to last decades while standards keep evolving? while standards keep evolving. Um, well, I would say that, you know, part of this effort of trying to make sure that we have our infrastructure solid is that we are providing resources at all levels. It's, it's certainly uh, from the state, we've been very conscientious about making sure in recent times that we were putting resources back uh, to the, meet the technology. And case in point, the, the early warning uh, when I had the first opportunity to, to see what was going on here at uh, Caltech and the Seismic Lab and how we were in a position to at least be able to predict an, or uh, early warn about a prediction of an earthquake coming within 20 some odd seconds, and that's huge. And as I, my team and I were asking questions, um, we were getting the information that suggested that in California, there was additional resources that would be needed in order to make sure that this program was implemented in as effective a way as possible. So in that year, taking that information, um, I was able to go back uh, to the legislature, work with the governor and, the, and both houses, and we were able to get a one-time $8.8 .8 million for the program, $3.2 million ongoing. So it would allow for us to see the uh, early warning detection in place sooner than later. As it, as it relies, relates to um, hospitals and others, we are certainly trying to make sure that policies and, and standards are in place that are instructive, but not uh, punitive, that puts a over financial burden on the ability to meet those, those standards. It's imperative that we have them uh, and that we set an appropriate time frame because it is about economics as well, uh, but we, we wanna make sure that we, at some point in a reasonable time frame, can see comfortably those, um, those requirements in place and implement it, because it's necessary. I know I'm supposed to be moderator, but I am gonna add one thing here. Right now, we ask the minimum out of our building code. Yeah. We say, make sure the building doesn't kill you that the only role of government is to prevent the building from killing you. If you build such a weak one, it's a total financial loss. That's your choice to make. And the estimates to go to a building that could be repaired and doesn't have to be torn down is maybe 0.1 to 1% increased cost of construction. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we need to start thinking in a longer term about how we do it. And as long as we only ask for the minimum, we're gonna have to keep on improving because we'll discover our minimum was too low. Yeah. Amen. <laughs>
on, on that little political note, um, <laughs> let's see. Whatever Lucy Jones tells me to do, I just... <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is actually a cool one that just came in, so I, would, I think maybe we'll... I, this should probably be the last question, but do urban areas like Los Angeles have a higher seismic risk than they would otherwise due to human activities like wells or the weight of buildings? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question in the sense that, you know, if an earthquake is happening in the middle of nowhere, then it's actually not causing any damage. So by having a big urban area, you're exposing more people for the same size of mm -hmm. earthquake. So in that sense, there is a higher uh, hazard there. Um, in terms of human activities, you know, humans do <laughs> accidentally cause earthquakes. Yeah. So, so, like, for example, you may have heard about all those uh, waste well, wastewater wells in Oklahoma when they inject large amount of water underground, and when they're getting too close to some of the major faults, they cause earthquakes. Mm -hmm. For a while, they have more earthquakes than California uh, every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. So that was scary. So, uh, but in California, we don't have as many of those problems. So I think. Most of, yeah. There yeah, because we have a law that says you yeah. have to pump any, anything you pump out, you have to replace, yeah. so we don't change the water pressure yeah. underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And buildings don't cause earthquakes. I, the weight of buildings doesn't cause earthquakes. Yeah, they're not going to be yeah. a significant yeah. factor. Yeah. They're about the weight of an extra 10, 20 feet of, of sediment. They, yeah, and sometimes we even make sure that the weight of the building we build is more or less the same as the weight of the soil we remove when they have multiple uh, subgrade displacements, uh, so that we won't cause a lot of disruption in the in the in the sediments around. So, yeah. Um, I think it's time. We've got more questions, but this could go on for a long time, and we don't have that much time. I do think it's time for uh, us. To, I understand that the assemblyman has a um, uh, something you want to tell us. I think it's time for that. Oh, sure. Well, thank you. You can go to the podium or you can sit where you are. I will go to the podium. <laughs> you know, as a, a citizen of Pasadena and the San Gabriel Valley, and, and certainly over the years, uh, having had an opportunity to be mayor in Pasadena, Caltech has been uh, a resource and a jewel for this city uh, and for this region and quite frankly for this nation and the world. And we're very proud to say that you're a part of this community, uh, but we're also proud to recognize the great work that has been longstanding. And with the seismology laboratory at Caltech, 100 year anniversary. That's a major time frame that's elapsed here that we have seen great work happen. And so on behalf of the California State Assembly and on behalf of my colleagues, I wanted to present this to President Rosenblum, this uh, resolution recognizing the 100 year anniversary of the seismology lab and all the great work and all of the great scientists that have come during that period of time that have been part of the contribution to putting us in the strongest position that we're in now to be able to have a better handle on what's happening with the earth around us and earthquakes in particular. So congratulations on a wonderful accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman, both for this honor and for your leadership and support. And uh, as we improve the early warning system, a lot of that goes to your foresight and vision and being able to generate the support that makes that possible. Uh, I, I'd like to thank the uh, panel as well. This was clearly th the director's cut in terms of uh, the panel performance. And I, thank, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Um, I hope this independent study was uh, helpful, and uh, no hacking, please. Just enjoy the rest of the afternoon.